Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. We have been in a series called Back to the Basics. We've been talking about doctrines and what we believe at the church. Last week we were talking about the rapture and the end times. Today we're talking about heaven. And believe it or not, the Bible doesn't have a ton of detail about heaven. There are over 50 verses that use the word heaven or allude to heaven, but there's not a lot of great detail if you wanted to try to figure out what heaven was going to be like. In fact, there's technically more information about hell than there is about heaven in the Bible. When I was a youth pastor, um, during Halloween, I would throw services called the nightmare, and we would turn the teen center into hell, and people would come take a tour, and we'd scare the tar out of everybody, and at the end, try to get them saved, you know, like good Christians do. And one day a parent came up to us and they're kind of upset. And they're like, you know, you put all this energy into talking about hell and scaring everybody. Why don't you do one of these kind of services about heaven and transform the teen center into heaven? You know, I couldn't get any teens to volunteer to be actors. It was like kind of boring to them to think about heaven and clouds and peaceful and harps and angels. Like there wasn't anything attractive to try to act this way and convert people to want to go there. Um, my point being with this is that there's a lot of information about heaven that we don't talk about, that we don't have conversations about. We all want to go there one day, not today, and none of us want to die to get there. Right? There's always been this hope, well, I think that the Lord's going to come before I die and I'm just going to go. I'm just going to walk up to heaven. Chances are you're not. Right? Chances are it's not going to be anytime soon, although we need to prepare as though it's right now, okay? Here's something that we all want to hear, Matthew 25, 34, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I believe that that's one of those things that all Christians here who enter into their eternal rest as they come into heaven, he says, come. All who are blessed by my Father, inherit what I prepared for you. I, he said, I have to go away and I'll prepare a place for you. This is what he's talking about. We all desire to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. And as much as Jesus' death on the cross removed the separation between God and man, there still is a separation that we have today with God, if we want to be honest, okay? Technically there isn't, but there actually is, right? If, if I said today during worship, as, as the band kind of was playing and Pastor Chris stopped singing and there was like a somber moment in there, like did every single person here feel the presence of God? I don't know that everybody did. Right? And so how can one person feel God and another person not feel God? Did you hear God speak to you during a quiet time in worship? I don't know. I mean, I, it felt nice, but was that God? See, because there's this question, right? There's, there's still this uncertainty of was that just a peaceful moment or was that God? Because we still have this flesh, we still have this mind that, that rationalizes things out. But there will be a day, there will be a day that we will be eternally in God's presence. That we will eternally, now listen, and, and I'm, I'm trying to be very clear. We are in God's presence, but we just don't live it like we're going to live it then. He is always here. He is always around. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's closer to us than a brother. He's more real to you than the person sitting next to you. But our awareness of his presence is not as strong as it will be one day when we step 
into eternity. I'm going to say something today, and I don't want you to simply agree with me just because I'm the pastor and I'm up here preaching this. If you disagree with me, that's absolutely okay, right? Theology is how we interpret scripture. We read scripture, we interpret it, and it's okay for us to have different points of view, right? Unlike in the world today, we all have to be politically the same, right? No one's allowed to have a different political view. It is okay to look at heaven differently because heaven, the scripture isn't 100% specific about it. Here's what I want to get to. There is an eternal place that we will spend with God, and people often refer to that kingdom simply as heaven, okay? We say, one day I'm going to be where God is in heaven. I just want to open your mind up a little bit more, and as, as much as I believe in heaven, I believe that God resides in a place called eternity, eternity. And eternity operates outside of our time and space. Our time and space is 24 hours per day, the sun rises and the sun sets, and it's a line, a line of time. And when we try to figure things out and we look through our past, we write a timeline of our life. And I believe that God operates outside of our timeline. The church agrees, and we call it the place heaven, but it is eternity. Eternity past, in eternity present, eternity forever. Because the Bible paints a richer picture than just a singular place called heaven. And if you were raised in a legalistic kind of scary church, you kind of pictured God in heaven on his throne, and his throne was kind of like a courtroom, and he was sitting there with a scepter in his hand, hopefully a beautiful white beard, but judging everybody and everything. And be careful, because God is in his throne, and God is watching, and God is judging. But wonder if he wasn't. Wonder if that wasn't the case. Wonder if God was in heaven, eternity, on his throne, but it was more like a family room, lazy boy armchair, and he was full of joy and peace and laughter, and he was the kind of grandfather that you wanted to run and jump on the chair with him and hug him and tell him how much he loved you and how much you loved him and I mean, would did that change things about God and heaven and eternity? Because in my opinion, heaven isn't your final destination. You can disagree with me. Just, I asked to study it out. I don't believe heaven is your final destination. There's a song on the radio that I can't wait to go to heaven because heaven is my home. No, it's not. If heaven was your home, then God would have created us all in heaven. He would have made Adam and Eve in heaven, but he didn't. He made Adam and Eve on the earth, and he said, we have created men, and we have created them in our image, and after our likeness, you created them, both male and female, to have dominion over the birds of the air and the fowl and of the, of the bird, yeah, the birds of the air and the fowl and the fish of the sea and the land and everything that creepeth on the ground, that they would have dominion and rule the earth. We created them in our image and after our likeness. I got in this huge debate in Bible school on the topic of the Imago Dei. What is the Imago Dei? What is the image of God? Or do we look like God? And I was like, oh my gosh, you guys are missing the whole point. If we just look at it in context, God made man in his image and his likeness. Have dominion. We made him in our image. What's the subject matter? Dominion, rulership, to reign in this kingdom, in this life, on this earth. So as much as we are going to go to heaven, and that is true, that's not the final destination. Isaiah 66, says, the new heavens and the new earth God will make. A new heaven and a new earth God will make. And so yes, when we leave this body, we do go to heaven. But there will be a time 
There's going to be this age, the apocalypse, whatever you want to call it, that this earth that we now live on will be destroyed. And God will make a new earth for us to come and rule and reign with him, with him forever in his presence. This new earth or this eternity will be so rich and so good that in Isaiah 65, 17, it says, the former things will pass away. And the former things it talks about are death, pain, sorrow, suffering. And then it goes on to say, and you shall remember them no more. You shall remember those things no more. So there will be a time in eternity that we are back on earth living the life as it was originally designed. This place is where heaven and earth will join together. Revelation 21, 2. It says, and there will be a voice from heaven, and it will say this, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. That statement right there, out of Revelation, uh, I'm trying not to get too nerdy, but it goes all the way back to when the children of Israel had God in the Ark of the Covenant. God never wanted a temple. God never wanted them to waste their time on a building. He liked being with them, that he could travel with them and be in their presence. He was totally cool with being there. Man had to go about making the temple, so then, then he gave the instructions on how to make it. But go read it. Go, go read the scripture when, when David comes to God's like, I'm going to build you the most epic temple ever. And God's like, no, you're not. I didn't ask for it. Don't do it. This is all temporary. I'm only going to be here for a little bit. Don't waste your time. But God loved dwelling with his people because he eternally will dwell with us. Now, to be fair, the Bible does talk about God's dwelling place as heaven. So please don't think that I'm a heretic saying that God is not in heaven. All right? Matthew 6, 9. For all of our good Catholics in the room, we're taught how to pray. And Jesus said, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom. Right? So where is he? Our Father, who is in in heaven, yes, in heaven. In 1 Peter 3.22, Peter says that Jesus has gone to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. I'm not disputing or saying that there is no place of heaven, but I'm just saying that heaven is in eternity. It's in this place of eternity. Here's what I want you to understand about heaven. My personal belief. Heaven is the place where God most fully makes known his presence to bless. It's the place where God most fully makes known his presence to bless. I'm just telling you, there would be so much more of a joy in your Christian life if you saw God as a God who loves to bless his kids. You know, as a parent, I'm in no way a perfect parent, but what joy comes to my heart when I overhear my kids brag about a gift that I gave them, right? I mean, parents, have you ever had that? Like, you overhear your kid telling their friend, oh my God, look what my parents got me, this is crazy. I love hearing that. I love hearing the fact that my kids are bragging about how blessed they feel and I was able to do that. How much more is your heavenly father, who is a good father, want to bless his children and his people with good gifts? Do you know why many of us don't believe that? Because we don't walk in it. But it all goes back to the question, right? Did you feel God's presence this morning? Just because you didn't feel God's presence doesn't mean his presence wasn't here. And just because you don't experience God's blessing doesn't mean that he's not blessing. Blessing. 
Although God is everywhere, his, his presence to bless is most clearly seen in heaven, and his glory is most clearly seen in heaven. The glory of God. And I know that there's a lot of Pentecostal charismatic churches that pray about the glory of God, that they want to see the glory of God. And, and honestly, like, the, the, the world has had glimpses, little tiny moments of the glory of God. Some churches, the, the Brownsville Revival, uh, supposedly they had a Shekinah cloud of glory that appeared in their room for several months. Um, we've seen signs and wonders, we've seen healings and miracles, and we've seen bits and pieces of the glory of God. But it will be nothing like actually experiencing the fullness of God's glory in heaven. Heaven is the one place where everyone worships him. Heaven is a place where everyone worships God. The Bible says that there will be a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In addition to making a renewed heaven, God will renew his earthly creation, the earth and those who dwell in it. You can look that up in 2 Peter 3.13 and Revelation 21.1. Again, if this is your first time with us, this is our last week studying these kind of topics. Next week, we're going to start our Christmas holiday sermon series. It will be a little lighter, all right? Romans 8.21 says this, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. I love that. Um, I'm now 43 years old, which is not old. I'm not calling anybody 43 and older old, but I ain't 21 no more. And I'll tell you what happens at 43 years old. At 43, you wake up and your body hurts and you spend the first hour wondering, what did I do yesterday? Did I work out? Did I move differently? And then you realize, I didn't do anything yesterday. I'm just 43, and I woke up with a muscle cramp. This is what this is kind of talking about, right? The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay. It'll be set free from this aging process, this body breakdown, these these diseases that attack our body, degenerative diseases and things that break down the muscles and the body. There will be a day that that will be removed and the freedom of the glory of the children of God will be returned to us. In, in, in the curse on humanity in the book of Genesis when Adam and Eve ate of the apple, God cursed humanity. He said that man will now have to work by the sweat of his brow, that man will have to have hard work and that women were cursed with labor pains, right? Through pain, labor would occur and child, children would come into the earth. Now, I've watched that happen three times in real life. I can't imagine how the female body could go through that and it not hurt. But the original design, it was supposed to be painless, okay? In this new heaven and this new earth, that curse on humanity is removed. It's removed, okay? There is no more distortion of goodness or distortion of nature. There's no more deformity in childbirth. There's no more deformity in nature. There's no more destructions of hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and droughts and earthquakes. In fact, paradise is restored. Now, I want to say this is the only point in which I believe the Jehovah Witnesses have it right. Okay? So this is how I always get them into a great conversation. They come knock on my door. They say, sir, do you believe that there will be peace on earth one day? Yes, I do. They're like, really? Get them into the conversation. But the peace on earth is only going to come before the other stuff happens that they don't believe about, all right? If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, bam, we're done. No conversation going any further than that. 
Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's going to be a time of tribulation. There's going to be a rapture. God is going to take his people. The earth is going to be destroyed. A new heaven and new earth is going to be rebuilt. We'll come back and then there will be peace on earth. Once again, paradise restored. Those who live on this renewed earth will then have their glorified bodies that will never grow old, never become weak, and never wake up at 43 with a backache. With the curse of sin removed, all creation will return to its original state when God said in Genesis 131, it is very good. Life is renewed into this new living way. I believe a lot of things that we have now are going to exist in that new earth, in that new earth. As a kid, I thought about, man, God's going to create a new earth, and it's going to go back to the way it was at the Garden of Eden. And then I just thought about naked people all over the earth, eating apples and grapes and no homes and no houses and no technology and no iPhones, no TV, no internet. And then I thought to myself, wait a second, it ain't going to go back to that. It ain't going to go back to that. The creative God, the God who created the heavens and earth and gave us the intellect to create technology, I actually believe that it's going to be far more technologically advanced than we are now, but without sin in his perfect design. Check this out. It's probably one of my favorite verses, Revelation 19.9. It says, on the new earth... All will eat and drink at the marriage supper, supper of the Lamb. Yo, we eating some food up in here. All right? We're going to have some food, some dinner parties. Don't go too far with this one, but Luke 22 says Jesus will once again drink wine with his disciples. The river of the waters of life will flow through the middle of the streets of the city. And the tree of life will yield 12 kinds of fruit, one for each month. So that tree of life that we had to be protected from is now going to be something that we can all partake of, producing new fruit, different fruit, 12 fruit, one for each month. Music is certainly a prominent part of heaven and what happens in heaven. It says that people are worshiping God and glorifying him. And I believe that humans will continue to exercise dominion and creativity, technology, inventions, fully reflecting the glory of God. God is a creator. He created us to be creators. And although the new human beings will have bodies that will be like God, we will not be God or gods. Here's one thing that I do look forward to. The Bible says right now we see in part and we know in part, but one day we will know all things as God knows all things. So there will be a time that we will have infinite knowledge, that we will know the things of the Lord. Finally, the renewed heaven and the new earth will be a place where we can fully enjoy the treasures of heaven. The Bible says that while we are here in this life, we store up treasures in heaven where moths cannot decay. Right? So when we do good deeds and good acts, the Bible says it is accounted unto you for righteousness' sake, and there is stored up for you a treasure in heaven. And I, I have this mindset that there's going to be some people that when they get to heaven, they're going to be like heaven billionaires, and then there's going to be people on heaven welfare. <laughs> there's going to be some people who need some state assistance. Right? So... Save up a little bit for your neighbor because they might need some help. What do, why are you saying all this? Because there is a life that we ought to live right now. There's a life that we ought to live right now. A good life. A good life. I want to make this statement. Eternity or eternal life is not simply a quantity of time but it is a quality of life that we should start living now. 
We should start living eternal life now. It is a quality of life. It's the God kind of life. It is the kingdom life. It is the dominion life that salvation gives us. We should be eating the good of the land. We should be full of joy. We should be full of peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. We should be loving our neighbor as ourself, even if they believe politically different. We should love our neighbor as ourselves. We should be doing good to those around us. Being good doesn't get you into heaven, but because you are a Christian, it should produce goodness and holiness in you and through you. We ought to live lives that glorify God. By doing this, we begin to live eternal life now. Here's a hope. Revelation 21.4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. We spoke about that a little bit earlier. That's a great hope. That's a great hope, especially for someone who deals with depression, someone who deals with sadness, that there is this hope. One day, every tear is going to be wiped away, and that the joy of the Lord would be your strength. Even more exciting is that a relationship with God will be experienced unhindered. Unhindered relationship with God. Here's another cool fact, that, there, that it seems that there may not be any need for lights, like street lights, at night. Revelation 21, 23, for the glory of God gives it light, and it's the light, that, and its light is the lamb. So you can go ahead and study some of this stuff out, see, see what you think about heaven, see if you can find more information. My biggest point was this, that what, what I want you to take away is that we will spend eternity with God, whether in a place called heaven or back in a place called earth, it is in eternity with God, right? We will forever be in the presence of God, whether in the place called heaven or back on the new created, recreated earth, it will be the presence of God. You can go ahead and look this up in Jude 24, Romans 8:18, 1 Corinthians 15:43. All my notes are on the website directly underneath the video. There's a link that you can push, and it's my notes uh, typically word for word. Here's my last big thing that I look forward to in Revelation 22.4. It says that we will see his face. We will see his face. And as much as I can sit down and, like, draw images of, like, God and heaven and and I can look through the scriptures and I can see that God has feet and God has hands and God has a backside. I can never draw God's face. Like when I get to that part of God and I want to say, okay, does he have a big nose or small nose? Does he have a beard or no beard? Does he have a strong chin or a weak chin? Like what does God's face look like? In my mind, I can never draw it. To me, it's almost like it's just a glowing essence of glory. It's just, the Bible says that his face shines upon you. And that's all I can just see is like this glowing aura of God's face. But there will be a day that we can see him face to face. We can see his face. And in God's face, we will see and experience the fulfillment of all the things that we've longed for in our hearts. The longing to know perfect love. The longing to know perfect peace. The longing to know perfect joy. The longing to know truth and justice. The longing to know holiness, wisdom, goodness, power, glory, 
beauty. All those things are going to be known in a moment when we see him face to face. Father, we thank you and we praise you that we could go through this 12-week study of doctrine and what we believe and some fun stuff and some not so fun stuff. Lord, we thank you for loving us so much that you created a plan for us. Before the foundation of the earth, you knew us, you called us by name. You put a purpose and a destiny and a calling in the heart of every creation. We thank you for that. Lord, I pray as we move on in our lives from glory to glory and grace to grace that you would continue to reveal that plan to us. Help us to know you more intimately and, and to know you're leading and you're directing. I pray, God, that as we leave here today, we are rested in knowing that you are our God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are a creative God. Lord, I thank you that we are blessed coming in. We'll be blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you. See you next week. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.